All right. Well, we will get started. And if you're welcome, if you're visiting with us on live stream, uh, we can see you. You, you know, you, you can see us, and we can see you. So be careful. Just kidding. We can't see you, but we're glad you're here. And here comes Miss Owens. Yeah, just h hustling in, hustling in. There's a handout over there. Well, then we need, if that's true, then we need to fix this clock because I go by that clock. There you go. Well, uh, we have been studying in our Bible study, we have been studying the subject of prayer, and we want to be careful not to be guilty of what is the most obvious temptation, and that is to talk about prayer but not pray. Uh, that's the problem that many of us have. I've had it. I have it. Uh, I've seen the church have it. The church can have a great theology of prayer, but a very poor practice of prayer. So let's always make sure that when we're talking about prayer that we're also praying, okay? So let's bow together and we'll open with prayer today. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege we have to gather together to study your word. We ask that you would speak to us through your word today. And as we think specifically about the subject of prayer, we would ask, Lord, for your insights into this marvelous privilege that you've given us, that we might uh, uh, take, it, take advantage of it and uh, come boldly before your throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace to help us in our times of need. We live in a world that is in desperate need of prayer, of your intervention, and we would ask, Lord, for uh, a, a faith that constantly prays for the circumstances that are happening in Ukraine and surrounding areas. Father, how we pray that you would be pleased to bring peace to that land and that you would uh, guard, uh, safeguard the people there who are uh, struggling, who are frightened, who are uh, running for their lives. Father, how we would pray that restraint might be uh, the order of the day in the Russian government, that they would withdraw, that they would um, cease from the aggression that has been uh, infiltrated upon the people there. Father, we do ask that you would bless other nations. This is not the only hot spot around the world. There is suffering in every direction. There is pain. There is fear. There is anxiety. Father, we all fear it, fear it in our own hearts, and we pray that you would give us your peace that passes understanding, that you would keep our eyes fixed upon you, and that you would enable us to, um, to, to navigate through difficult waters uh, with a confidence in your presence and peace. Uh, open our hearts and eyes now to your word as we study these prayers in Jesus' name, amen. So, you have a handout that uh, has two passages on it. I, I, I've been so impressed with your ability to process what we're doing that I just I figured I'd do a double, double take today and actually look at two different passages. One's in the Old Testament, one's in the New Testament. One is long, the other is short. One has a, an involved prayer and the other just has a cry for help. But I think there are so many similarities between these two situations that they can be kind of compared and uh, viewed together. So let's, let's kind of see what happens with these two passages. The first, the one on the top, comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The one on the bottom comes from Mark chapter 4. My guess is you will recognize the Mark 4 passage and perhaps not be as familiar with the 2 Chronicles passage but we will look at it and we will make some sense of it. So, here is our passage. I hope you can read that fine print. If you can't, just listen up and get a magnifying glass later that maybe it would help you read it. But here we are in the middle of Second Chronicles, and of course this is during the period of the kings. This is during the time of the divided kingdom. You remember that God gave his people uh, entrance into the promised land. When they came into the promised land, they drove out the nations that were in the land, except for a couple that God said, don't mess with them. And uh, 
the people of God lived there for a time, and then they said, let us have a king. And uh, God didn't want them to have a king. He wanted to be their king. But they said, no, we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king of our own. Okay, so God gave them Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. And then shortly thereafter, the, kingdoms, the, 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 the kingdom broke. And there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Kind of sounds like the United States. You had the Mason-Dixon line, and you had certain tribes that, went nor that were in the north and certain tribes that were in the south. The northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. And you have in the book of Kings and Chronicles the stories of the kings. You may have had it, if you had a Bible class in college, you might have had to memorize the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. Uh, that would be a challenge to spell them all. But uh, one of the kings of Judah is a man named Jehoshaphat. He was a good king. Now, you don't see a whole lot of folk naming their children Jehoshaphat, do you? Maybe, uh, maybe it would, you wouldn't want to name them that because what would they be nicknamed? Fat. <laughs> hey, fat. So anyway, uh, 2 Chronicles 20. And we're just going to dive right in. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Meonites. Okay, let's stop. There are still lots of kind of little rogue nations around. Uh, they still surround Israel. They still surround the, the promised land. And they're always kind of like mosquitoes. You know, they just, you can't get rid of them. They are, they're always there to make life miserable for you. And there, there comes a point where they band together because they want to do more serious damage to Judah. So the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meonites come together and they came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Now that's the aggression of neighboring nations, which we're seeing now on a greater scale in Ukraine. So some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. Behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Okay, here's his intel. Here, here is his security staff uh, informing him of what's on the horizon. They, they've detected movement among the Ammonites, the Meonites, the Moabites, and the Parasites, and all the rest of the Ite cousins. And they are, they are headed their way. They're close. Verse 3, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. Now stop there. I appreciate the fact that it says he was afraid. I'd have been afraid, but I might have been, I, I, should I be afraid? I'm not supposed to be afraid. I'm not supposed to you know, react. I mean, but he's, he's, a, he's a normal guy. He's an ordinary guy. He's the king, yes, but he's afraid. Afraid for himself, afraid for his people, afraid for the Lord's land. Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord. That's the important thing. What do you do with your fear? Where do you turn when you're afraid? He set his face to seek the Lord. And as a leader, look at what he does as a leader. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. That's pretty serious. You know, once a year we talk about the National Day of Prayer and we think we're pretty righteous, right, that we have in our nation a National Day of Prayer. Well, here is the King of Israel proclaiming a fast throughout all of Judah. Now, I'm sure there were a lot of teenagers that weren't real happy about having to fast. You know, they might have said, well, I'll give up this or that, but don't make me give up food. But Jehoshaphat was serious. And, Jeho and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. It, it sounds like the, the fast brought the people of Judah to Jerusalem, where they would together assemble to seek the Lord. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord. You see, they had built the temple, 
right? Under Solomon, they had built the temple in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, and so with verse 6, we finally come to Jehoshaphat's prayer, and that's what we're studying, prayers. Notice what he says. O Lord God of our fathers. Okay. God of our fathers. The covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. The God who has been faithful to us through the years. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's, that's something worth doing when you pray is to realize you're, you're praying to a God who's History is one of faithfulness, one of deliverance, of presence, of promise, of provision. There's a lot just in those words, the God of our fathers, because he's saying we're coming to the same God to whom Moses turned, to whom Abraham turned, and so forth and so on. Are you not God in heaven? He's not really asking a question there. He's just kind of hypothetically or theoretically saying, okay, our Father who art in heaven, you are the God who rules in heaven. Therefore, if you are in heaven, you have power over the affairs of men on the earth. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. These nations that are coming against us, these nations that think they're so strong and think they're so smart and think they're going to make us miserable, you rule over them. In your hand are power and might. You're the one that holds power. You're the one that has might so that none is able to withstand you. These nations that think they're they're so empowered to uh, attack us. They cannot withstand you. And then he gives a history lesson. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? You remember when they came into, into the promised land, they crossed the Jordan into Canaan, and they drove out the many nations, the, the many tribes of people that were there because God had given this land to his people forever. And God drove them out. That's what the book of Joshua is all about. And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name. So your people have lived here. They've built this sanctuary saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, famine. We will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. That's what they had said when they built the sanctuary, that they would gather in times of disaster, in times of doubt and fear and famine and pestilence, and they would cry out to God and they would anticipate his blessing. And he says in verse 10, And now, behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. You may remember that historical moment where God, God said, you know, Come this way, but don't, don't mess with these folk. He, he left some folks un, untouched, and now God had, you might say, mercy upon them, and they're turning around and coming back to, to harm God's people. Behold, verse 11, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. How, how are they thanking us for not eliminating them in the first place? Well, they're coming to kind of take us, take us over. Verse 12, O our God, will you not execute judgment on them? Do whatever it is you feel is necessary for the moment to judge them for their uh, hostility toward us, or we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We are powerless. Here's a king, the king of Israel, or king of Judah, saying, we're powerless. 
Now, I don't know the statistics of what their military was like, but <laughs> they must have felt that they didn't stand a chance against these warring nations. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Oh, isn't that a good, good line? That, that, that is really a, one worth memorizing. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. How many times have you kind of thought that or said that? Probably a lot. There are times you just, you don't know what decision to make. You don't know whether to go or to stay. Turn this way or that way. But you say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And that's a great place to be with your eyes on him and trusting and asking for his intervention. You know, I, that's probably what a lot of people are saying about, you know, Ukraine right now. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? I hope they're saying, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Right? So here's Jehoshaphat, who faces this incredible danger, initially has fear, he was afraid, but his fear led him to seek the face of the Lord, to proclaim a fast, and then to lead the people of God in a prayer that speaks of God's person, to, speaks of God's faithfulness over the years, the history of where they are and why they're there, and, and their commitment to cry out to him in their affliction, their confidence that he will hear and save, pleading with him to execute judgment, admitting their lack of power, but fixing their eyes on him. I like that prayer. And if you want to know the rest of the story, 2 Chronicles 20, uh, it's, it's not that long. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, their children. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said to them, Listen, all Judah inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Don't be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde, because for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them, and behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position. See the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing and praise him in his holy attires. He actually sent the choir out first. The choir probably thought, Whoa, hold on now. <laughs> I didn't join the choir to be in battle, but... He sent the choir out first to say, Give thanks to the Lord, for His steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and they were routed. And it goes on to talk about the spoil that is taken. God gives them victory. And at the end of the, this story, it says, And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. Jehoshaphat was, some translations say, at peace, for his God gave him rest all around. At the beginning of the chapter, you have this alarm. You have this fear. At the end of the chapter, you have peace and quiet. Isn't that, isn't that great? God was faithful to them, delivered them in response to the prayers of God's people. I just think that's a great, great prayer. Now, compare that prayer to what we find in Mark chapter 4. 
And this is just one of those situations, circumstances, experiences that Jesus has with his disciples. And in Mark chapter 4 at verse 35, we just kind of dive into this record of, of the ministry of Jesus. And it says, On that day, when evening had come, he, Jesus, says to them, Let us go across to the other side. Okay, so it's his idea to go to the other side of the lake, right? He's not... Nobody's forcing him to do this. He's the one who's leading them to do this. And leaving the crowd, they took with him, they took him in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. So we have this little flotilla of boats that are making their way across the lake. And you wonder how many times they've done that. Probably it's not the first time, right? These are fishermen. These are guys who are familiar with the lakes around and know their way around. A boat. Verse 37 says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Have you ever been on the lake when a, a, a windstorm came up suddenly? It can happen, I assure you. One, one minute things can be calm as everything, and the next minute out of nowhere, here comes this storm, and it comes through this little squall, and it can really put the fear of the Lord in you, because it can be pretty strong. And that's apparently what happened because these experienced, uh, you know, sailors are, are in this storm and it was, it was getting kind of dicey. Verse 38, but Jesus was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, and this is, this is the line that I call a prayer. It, it's, not, it's not a prayer in the same <laughs> sense that 2 Chronicles 20 is a prayer, but listen to see if you don't think it's a prayer. Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? It's addressing the Lord with a concern of your heart, but the essence of it is, don't you care? Oh, that kind of just sends chills up my spine to think that the disciples would even think that Jesus didn't care. Because if he did anything, he cared for them. And the God of the Scripture cares for us. Cast your burdens upon the Lord because he cares for you, First Peter says. But in the midst of this difficulty, they doubted the care of Jesus. My guess is that we've all done that. There have been times when we've thought, maybe we didn't say it, God, do you care? You care that I hurt so bad? You care that I've waited so long? Do you care that I've lost a loved one? Do you, where are you? Do you care? Yeah, we, we all ask that because that's kind of our reaction to difficulty and suffering and pain. Do you care that we are perishing? They really thought their lives were at risk. And Jesus awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. I don't know about you, but there's nothing quite as peaceful as a calm lake. You, you know what I mean? My brother has a place on the lake, and we go to it every summer with the family, kind of family reunion. You sit out on that porch, and sometimes the water is lapping, you know, back and forth. Boats have gone around out there. Or, but you get out in the morning. You get out in the morning where there are no boats are out, and it's like a sea of glass. It is as calm as you, you feel like you could walk on it. It is so calm and peaceful, and that's what's happening. Jesus says, peace, be still. The wind ceased. There was a great calm. And he says to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, Jehoshaphat was afraid. Back up there in chapter 20, verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid. So the Fear is kind of a natural reaction, but it's kind of what, what do you do with that? When, when you have that sense of panic or fear, what do you do with it? J 
Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast, the disciples were afraid and they rebuked the Lord for not caring about them that they were about to perish. Jesus says, have you still, still no faith? The, the, the life of the disciples is, is really fascinating, isn't it? You know, here these guys were, they walked with Jesus. Many of them left their vocations, occupations, families. They traveled with Jesus. They heard him speak. They watched him do miracles. But, you know, as you read the Gospels, they don't always get it. They're still a bit confused. They, they, they're on the inside, but it's, it's not, they're not really figuring it out yet, right? Even some of them until the resurrection didn't, didn't really get it. And here they are in Mark chapter 4. Have you still no faith? I mean, what do I have to do to prove to you that I will take care of you? And they were filled with great fear. Here's the fear again. Now they're, now they're not afraid of the winds and the waves. They, they're afraid of, of themselves, of their lack of faith. They're, they're, they're probably in awe of this one who has just calmed the storm and stilled the sea. They said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Here they are. They said to one another, Who is this? What do you think? Who, who is this? Which is a great question to ask, right? Ultimately, that's the ultimate question for all of us. Who is this? Who is this guy? Who is this Jesus? Is he just kind of a nomadic teacher that we have chosen to follow and help with his ministry of healing and or is this the Lord God of heaven and earth who's here in human flesh who is the redeemer of sinners who's here the Messiah who is this well that's what they're going to be learning through the New Testament is they're going to be learning who he is the light of the world the resurrection and the life the good shepherd so you have here two, two similar situations. There, there is danger, there is fear, there is threat, and you have Jehoshaphat who through his fear seeks the Lord, proclaims a fast, leads in prayer, trusts his God, and and ends up being granted peace. And then you have this group of disciples who, through their fear, rebuke the Lord, but begin to learn who he really is. Two crises, two reactions, two lessons learned, but one, obviously, one hero, and that is our living God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So... What do you do when you face circumstances that scare you? Pray. Pray. You watch news and you see what's going on in Ukraine. And let's imagine that Ukraine was Kentucky, that close, and that you heard that they were not only going to take Kentucky, but they were going to take Tennessee. It'd get your attention, wouldn't it? And yet they have missiles there's probably a whole lot more stuff out there that could be used that would make our life very interesting if it was used I mean there is cause for concern here we're not in a bomb shelter we're not in a safe haven it this all, all of this could could ramp up into something we've never seen so there is cause for concern and these prayers are appropriate for us to pray as Jehoshaphat prayed, you know, you're the God in heaven. You're the one who is the ruler over all the kingdoms of the nation. Your hand is powerful and mighty. 
And Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's a prayer we need to be praying right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these prayers, these situations in Scripture which happened so long ago, but in many ways continue to happen because we still face situations that create anxiety in us, fear in us, and if we're honest, we, we are concerned about what's going on in the world even today and what could come of it all, and uh, we don't begin to know what the end of all this will be. So we are afraid too. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us not to doubt, not to be like the disciples who would cry out to you and say, don't you care that we're perishing? Because we know you care. Help us to be like Jehoshaphat who, who, who reflected on your faithfulness through the years, your promises and your word, and rose up to uh, trust and to rest and to fix his eyes upon you. Help us to keep our eyes exactly there so that we don't get overwhelmed by the circumstances of the news reports. Keep our eyes upon your power, your might, your promises, your grace. Keep our eyes upon Jesus because he is the unique one. Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, he's the Lord of heaven and earth, the one before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Help us, Father, to rest and trust in him. For we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, my friends. Go get them. <laughs> Have a good day.